Cyclists official baseball historian, Matt Kovac. Matt, look at you out on the pier today, huh? I am right from the south shore of Lake Erie. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't look oh, like that now. <laughs> that's fantastic. Uh, and uh, what are you going to be talking about today? Well, today I'm, there's a project I've been working on. I, I call it the duality of baseball stats. It's mm -hmm. when you sort of take a look at stats, there's like, it goes one or two ways, sort of like baseball. You have offense and defense, you know, your batting team and your defensive team. And I stopped looking at stats and just tried to figure out what was at the bottom of all this to start building on top of. Um, and, you know, trying to determine what's a real stat, like a data point and what is inferred from it and what are estimators. Right. There's all kinds of different ways. So I just thought about it for a year while I was writing a bunch of history lessons every day. Um, and uh, just thought now that, you know, Pitcher List is offering more stats, more guys are making stats. This is sort of a way to sort of take a look and see wh where there might be a, some room for improvement. What are some of the things like, you know, people don't like saves, RBIs. Well, what, what if we really go down into history and what they mean, maybe we can do something better than mm. the saves and holds and all of these things to try to make them better. And since, you know, pitcher list is trying to make better stats, I thought it'd be a good idea to maybe let's have a new way to think about stats to try to make them better. Awesome. And, well, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, Matt, take it away. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Um, thanks everybody. Like I said, it's duality of baseball stats, the meaningful and mindfulness of stats. Um, and yes, I'm just a humble historian. But um, when it comes to, I know it sounds kind of strange, but I really got this idea when I was, I was doing some reading and I was reading about so the, the meaning of life versus the meaning of life, which in philosophy terms, people talk about what's it mean to be alive? What does it mean to have life, be this living being? And then at the same time, what does it mean to have meaning inside that life? Um, maybe like context, I call it meaningfulness. Um, but when we look at things like that, we can sort of separate, you know, maybe like what's a data point in baseball, like a run is a data point. Somebody scored a data point. Um, a run created is something we look at stuff and we infer this is what caused the run created. And then you might have something that, you know, might like be a, uh, estimator who, if somebody does X, Y, and Z, they should get this. Um, there's those types of stats inside there. So I want to take away um, and try to look at a way that we can do this. Um, and a, one big part of it was I spent about a year trying to figure out what could make an RBI a useful stat. So we could blame the RBI for a lot of this. Um, but the duality that comes in baseball stats comes in, um, you have data. Somebody hit a home run. Somebody scored a run. Somebody got a hit. That hit was a double. Um, we call those stats in baseball, but really they're data. Um, the game was played at 72 degrees with the wind coming in from southeast. Uh, the shadows were at certain spots during certain times. These are all data points that we can get. And if you go to RetroSheet um, and use uh, their play-by-play -play data and use um, another tool called Chadwick, you can get for each event in a baseball game about 162 different data points that people have versus who was the runner at second, who was the, who was the second baseman, where was the ball hit, what was the sequence that the ball went through, um, what happened to the guy at first, did he get the second, third, was he out? You have all of these types, and that's just data. And then when you go into something like a batting average, what you're doing is you're inferring some information from that data. Um, and... Once you do that, you lose a little bit of a clarity, but what you're trying to do is describe the game. So for me, a stat that describes the game, like a home run or a hit or a strikeout, um, tells you something about what's happening in the game. That, that, that's the meaning of the game part of it. The other things are what gives you context to the game. Um, you know, people tend to like to imagine Carlton Fisk or Bucky Dent or somebody, or even Rajay Davis, because we'll bring it back to Cleveland, um, hit this memorable home run. Um, once you start going and estimating, well, you know, there was a 
20% chance that he would do that, um, you're giving context to that event that you might remember and people are going to talk about for the rest of their lives. Um, and in fact, he gave Bucky a new, uh, Bucky Den a new middle name. So when you, when we look at data, we're also trying to bring some context to it. And even estimating is still a way to give context. Um, but it's not really giving you what happened in the game. Um, and also in baseball, when you come to duality, you have team stats and individual stats. So where you may be looking to see how good a team is doing or uh, a success of a team or the status of the team or things like that, those include individual in individual stats, and those build up to do something. So as you're building, say, a baseball team, the front office is looking at a way to um, take their players, take the individual stats, and optimize the team stats. So we sort of got a yin and a yang thing going there a little bit too. Um, you want your players to be great, but you also want your players to be great in a way that makes your team better. Um, so that's where you can start to find, say, defensively, which is where I put pitching. Pitching is part of defense. He's the guy that the pitcher puts the ball in play, and he has to often rely, if he doesn't get a strikeout, um, that uh, the fielders are going to do their jobs to help reduce, you know, make him look better. Uh, and a great example of that was in Cleveland this year when they were playing to Detroit. It was the eighth inning of a game. Third strikeout, the ball went back to the backstop. Um, so the catcher and the pitcher somehow got mixed up. The defensive side of that didn't go and happen. And the Indians scored, or the Guardians, sorry, I'm still doing that, um, scored six runs in there. Um, basically got four outs in an inning, scored six runs, effectively with three outs in the game. Uh, so pitchers, oh, there's a lot that pitchers have to rely on um, I'm sorry, on, on their fielding, they're part of that defensive side of the ball. Uh, it's interesting because they're one of the few sports where your offense can't really help your defense. If you look at football, your def your defense can really help your offense by say they get pinned down near the guard near near the goal line. Um, the defense plays doesn't doesn't allow maybe them to get a first down or keeps it to one or two then the special teams maybe has a good run back. So the, the other parts really helped, um, can help the offense and either way around. But in baseball, the offense can just score runs. Um, they can't really help them defensively. They can't really help. The only way they can help the defense is to score a bunch of runs. Um, so there's also a fine separation between offense and defense uh, when you take a look at it. Um, and um, when you look at stats, you often have to rely on when you're, say, creating a stat or getting there. If you want to get in, let's call a run, either you have to hit a run or you're going to need help from your teammates to score that run. Um, so there, there, there's a lot in baseball that ties in with everything. And when you're creating stats, you need to take that into account if you want to say, you know, once again, I'll use the RBI. We'll talk about that later. To get an RBI, you either hit yourself in or your, your teammates have to help you with that. Um, it, even if you want to be a pitcher and pitch 27 strikeouts, you're still going to need your catcher to make sure he catches every ball. Um, you pitch a no-hitter, your, your offense, your defense is going to have to do things, and including your offense is going to have to score at least one run um, to do that with a no-hitter, um, so things like that. And one of the things we also need to take into account and see if stats might be able to do, and this is something that I think I'm going to move forward with, is when we create new stats that show new parts of the game and give that game new context, we can actually start changing the data that in the game. If we get to the point where, at like, what I'll call like, you know, the postmodern version of baseball, which is when people started looking in and saying, where are things like on base percentage not emphasized as much? We're going to emphasize that a little bit. You started going and getting players that were slightly different than the ones. Um, so if you look at players in the 70s and the 80s, 
and then nineties, they start to change. And then once you get into the new century, those players are very, 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 very different. We started looking for and creating players that are different based on the context of the game. And now that has helped change the game a little bit to where strikeouts and home runs are much more prevalent. We don't steal bases as much. And all of that has come from stats that we have created or inferred from the data that we had there. Um, so there's really, you know, if you ask me, there's some really big things here. Um, so one of the things I did was I, I thought about this a lot. Um, that was an excuse to take my son to the park and he played and I sat and thought about stuff. Um, and using this, I tried to figure out what was the most important data point um, for this stat here. And I just kept coming back to runs. The way you win a game is you score more runs than you give up. Um, and in fact, you have the Pythagorean winning percentage, which takes into account how many runs did we score and how many runs did we give up. That should give us a general idea of what our winning percentage is. Um, and once that has happened and my battery's charged, you can look at then to see what more we can do with that. But I started thinking that wasn't quite enough. There's something else that comes in when you look at stats. And or when you look at runs, to runs, you have to get on base and you have to get closer and closer to home after you leave it. Um, so I really think a lot of what comes down to is you need to improve our, when you look at a baseball stat, it's really preventing somebody getting to the next base that they're at. The batter, not getting to first base. The man on first, not getting to second. R runner on second, not getting to third, so on and so forth. If you prevent people from doing that well, you have a more likely chance to do that. And then your offense doesn't have to be as good because then they don't have to advance bases as much. So runs are really important. If we say runs is the most important thing because that's how you win games. The biggest effect in runs is people moving on bases. Um, and to prove that or to take a look into that, I went and I started looking um, and there's plenty of information on here. I took these from somebody that had some decent pictures um, and I quoted them on there and I thank them very much for putting this and keeping that out on the web where the tools about being on base, the major ones are batting average. The problem with batting average is that it's actually a subset of on-base percentage. Batting average only talks about how many times you've got an official at-bat where there's a bunch of rules that can say, well, if you walked, it's not an at-bat. Um, if it was fielder's choice, so on and so forth, there are ways that it does not include that plate appearance. It just includes it, so it's a small subset. On base percentage just tells you how many times you didn't get an out for the most part. Um, um, and then um, if you look at that, if you look at just runs compared to batting average, it correlates to about 65%. You go to on base percentage, it gets up to about 83%. If you take a look at um, slugging percentage, which now comes into how many times were you have a plate appearance, and how far did you get? It's an indication of how close to home did you could get. That's the best way to look at it. If you're slugging 70, you know, 0.73, you're getting very, very close to second base every time you get up. Um, that correlates to about 80% on runs scored. And if you take a look, you can flip this over on the defensive side, and as a team is, if a team's slugging percentage that they give up on the defensive side is 80%. The, the correlation goes the same way. Now, somebody said, let's take on base percentage and slugging percentage and add them together, which mathematically doesn't make sense, but it comes out to a very good correlation. Here it's 91%. I've seen some other ones that it gets up to closer to 96%. So getting on base a lot and getting closer to home means that um, you, you're you more likely to score runs. The more often you score runs, the more often you're going to win games. 
So th this was my thinking about something and then going and looking for some very basic stats. There was more stats that I could have looked at, but these are very basic and directly deferred from the stats, the data that we collect at a baseball game. We know plate appearances. We know where they got on base. We knew I'll do that. That's very easy to get and correlate. So I, I use that as, okay, if we start looking at how we move on bases, how we stop them from moving bases, um, we do all that. And pitchers are probably going to hate me for this because I'm not really talking about how good of a pitcher you are. It's an overall team effort. Um, but you can also take these and put them towards individuals themselves. When you look at players that have a good uh, OPS, they generally are, if you wanna look at war or something like that, you can generally see that these are the better players that are helping their teammates a little bit more. Conversely, if a pitcher's OPS or the team defense OPS is low, they are generally not giving up a lot of runs. And this correlation happens individually and with the teams. And I think it's a good base point um, to start moving forward. Uh, this, and once again, I don't want to take away from people that do the estimates and linear weights. We'll talk about that later, but this is just very basic. It has a very good correlation. Obviously, if you're at 96%, you want to get closer to hundred. So part of what you want to look for in your stats evaluation or creating a new stat is how can that contribute to that additional 4%, 5% that we need to get so that we can get a better correlation to come in there to basically control how many runs we give up or to increase the number of runs that we score. Um, and this is sort of my recap uh, right here. Th this is when I said, okay, I'm in a good spot now. Um, and I, I remember when I got to this point because I did a uh, history story about history lesson on Twitter about Farius Fain, who was a, a played in the 50s. And back then, um, he played for 10 years. His on-base percentage was 400 or above. Um, yeah, his on-base percentage was 400 or above. 10 years, nine of the 10 years, and the other one it was 399. And he was definitely a man built to be playing this at this time. He wasn't there. Um, but his teams weren't as successful as White Sox and the Phillies. Um, the teams didn't seem to always have quite the success that he did. Um, and so I started looking at some of the reasons maybe why his numbers weren't as good um, as it, it, it maybe they would have been in this day and age. So that's, how, that's part of how I took that approach um, inside that. So like I said, one of the things I wanted to do is I wanted to find something useful about RBIs. So here is our list of RBI, people with the most RBIs in Major League Baseball history. There is a lot of great names on there. Um, and I do not wish to take away that says, you know, Albert Pujols is second and runs batted in, but that stat doesn't matter. Um, it's, an, it's an achievement of longevity, um, getting being good enough to get 13,000 plate appearances. Um it's an achievement to be above somebody like Babe Ruth, who helped change the game just by being the player that he was. It wasn't a stat that changed that era. A lot of it could be said that was Babe Ruth and maybe a little bit of uh, Lou Gehrig. And those Yankees teams made people have to become better, score better, stop better, you know, stop running better, and bring the game forward. But I looked at this duality of contacts versus um, – data to take a look at the RBI. And the biggest problem I found with it is it's actually it's double stat. RBI as a data point records when the guy who's that somebody scored and that somebody got credit for knocking them in. It, when you're looking at stats or when you're doing data, if you see that you're recording something twice, something might be wrong with your methodology there. But I can understand why they wanted to do it. Inherently, when you read about baseball, they knew it was important to get the man over to the next base and get him home to score runs. They were tr what they were really trying to do is give credit um, 
not just to the person that scored the run, but also to the person that they decided was ultimately responsible for getting that person in. Part of the reason they did that is because you get a run scored if you hit a home run. Now, remember back when they were thinking a lot of a lot of these basic stats and when they were formulating them and figuring out how to do a scoring system, it was the 1860s and the 1870s and the 1880s. Home runs weren't a big thing. Stealing bases, errors, those types of things were very were very prevalent back in those days. Um, in fact, if you look back at some of the pitching rules, pitchers during those days may have thrown a whole bunch of innings. They were also throwing underhand and being told, well, I want the ball high, so the batter got to choose how they threw the ball, and you had to try to trick the person knowing what was coming. So I can see why they brought the RBI in, but there's several problems with it. Um, and mainly it's to, to be a good RBI person, you have to have very good players in front of you that get on base often and get in a position where they're, it's easy for you. It's relatively easy, quote unquote, um, says the fat man sitting in a chair to get that man that get that base runner from the base they're on to home. Um, and that's part of the reason. And they don't consider uh, a batter or a runner in scoring position is not considered first base just because it was much easier to get them in from second or third. So they considered that a scoring position. When I think if a runner's on first base, he's in scoring position. Um, and there should, you know, you can have strategies to try to get him closer to home. And then some I'll talk about a little bit later. But not you just you have to have players that get on base and then have a high OPS. That's what they were trying, I think, to really say about which is why they gave an RBI. And there, there's a couple other ways. And if you've gone through baseball history, you'll see there it has it, it comes up and down. Um, a lot of it is stolen bases are um, actually pushing fielders to throw the ball. A good example of this. Um, from recent history is Billy Martin and Moneyball, and I wrote an article about him, Moneyball, is he pushed players to run. Um, he had Ricky Henderson in the 80s uh, with the 80 uh, Angels. Um, the man had Harlem Killebrew, who was 34 years old and at the end of his career, attempt to steal home three times in 1969. What he did is he put, since his team's, were basically slap hitters with maybe a couple power hitters. He was trying to get those teams to get past first base as much as possible. The way he had to do that was by running. Um, and he wanted to try to get the players to move from first to third more often. Th this was part of his philosophy. You could see some of that with the Guardians in 2022, where especially after Ramis left, um, and we did. We only really had, you know, the Guardians only really had Jose Ramirez and his bad thumbs as a a consistent power hitter. Th they started to take the team and say, "We're going to run." Uh, the Minnesota Twins hated, claimed they hated the way that the Guardians played because it made the fielders stay on their toes. Um, they were good at stealing bases, and some of the best from the running stats that they have out there that I've seen on fine graphs and that the uh, guardians had two or three of the best runners there. So they were getting to those extra bases. They were doing that. And that is a way to help improve RBIs, but more importantly, it's a way to improve runs. So that is part of the philosophy. The, the guardians just could not sit and wait for somebody to hit a big home run because they didn't have a bunch of big home run hitters until SpongeBob was in the audience and there was somebody um, playing in the playoffs. Until then, it was much more trying to slowly score by getting closer to home and having somebody get a hit. But to emphasize this a little bit, and this was part of my research, I looked at Joe Carter's 1990 season. Um, he played for the Padres at the time. He had just left. I was heartbroken when he left, when he was traded although we got Sandy Alomar Jr. in that trade. Um, but he went there and he had 115 RBIs. Um, he only batted 232. His on-base percentage was 290. Um, and uh, 
he was slugging 391. It wasn't a very good year. Um, you notice he ended up in the MVP, 17th of the MVP with those numbers because of those 115 RBIs, which were very important to people back in those days. And that could evaluate you, your talent evaluation by doing RBIs. The reason he had so many RBIs is he had Roberto Alomar, Tony Gwynn, um, and Tony Clark sitting and hitting in front of him. These guys got on base at almost a 40% clip. Joe Carter, when he batted, there was 452 times that there was runners on base, or 452 runners on base when he went there. If you take away his 24 home runs, he only knocked in um, 91 people of those 542. So while the, the RBI stat looked very good for Joe, um, and he is still a very good player, you can see here that perhaps maybe we, instead of looking, when you look at RBIs, you need to look at opportunities. And that is a data point that we do have. You can go into Retro Sheet, see where the people were on base. Um, and you might even be able to, you can go through a year and get run expectancy. Uh, you know, what should happen when this happens? And then maybe a way that we move away from RBI is start looking and say, how much better did he make the run inspectancy? Or just how many times did he move people forward closer to home? Maybe a total basis um, per opportunity with people on base. Something like that. That would be one way to take a look, look at that. But in researching this, I found another one that I had completely forgot about. And this is from 1985. Uh, Tom Herr was a slap hitting second baseman about along the lines of Dwayne Kuyper, except he hit a few more home runs than Dwayne Kuyper's one. And I, I showed his numbers here. Um, you see, he he gets a, he played a lot of games. He gets a lot of at bats. I mean, he played a lot. He hit a lot. Didn't walk a whole bunch. Um, but uh, one year he hit 110 RBIs. He was credited for 110 RBIs. It helped him get to number five in the MVP voting, and he went to the All-Star game. The main reason that that happened is because that Cardinals team, with Whitey Hergard as the coach, ran a lot. And they had Vince Coleman, Willie McGee, Andy Benslake, and Ozzie Smith inside that lineup. They stole 110 bases, 56, 34, and 31 response uh, each are there. Uh, and her also had 31. They also were generally pretty good at getting on base. Uh, Vince Coleman wasn't quite as good, but the other, so these guys were getting on base, were decent runners. And there was a, plenty of times when they got on base, they could increase, get closer to home. And Tommy Her used that to have a, a, a wonderful year. Um, where he was hitting the ball a lot. He was getting that ball inside there with his speed. He was taking away double plays and little things like that. So he made the most of his opportunities. I think he had like 430 some odd op times people were on base and he knocked in quite a bit more, making more of his opportunity because he only hit eight home runs. So he had 102 times he helped somebody else get in and he got credit for that. So you, part of an RBI is, was that opportunity um, and also making the best of that opportunity. And that's not reflected in an RBI. And it's really hard to reflect that anyway. I really think it would be nice if one of our smart people here at Pitcher List found a way to take that because um, those people are much better math than I am. But my biggest frustration with the RBI happened in 2001. There was this guy named Barry Bonds. You may have heard of him. He hit 73 home runs. He only had 137 RBIs, which meant he got credit for knocking himself in more often than he got credit for knocking one of his teammates in. And why was that? Well, first of all, he was hitting third. <laughs> so 
especially at the beginning of the game, he, he was almost always he was always batting in the first inning. And the odds are he didn't have anything in front of him. Because that was the year when a unforgettable people were the leadoff hitters for the Giants. They got on base maybe 33% of the time. Um, their number two hitter <laughs> hit 37 home runs and 37 doubles. So even if there was a rare chance <laughs> that um, the leadoff hitter was on base, there's a good chance that the number two hitter was going to knock them in with a home run or possibly knock them in with a double. Barry Bonds had a ridiculously low number of times, and I can't remember the exact number, where with people on base when he batted. Now the people behind Bonds in uh, that, which were like A.J. Pergolinski and some of those guys, had some really good years with um, RBIs because Barry Bonds was getting on base all the time. He was quite often knocked in by his got on base and then was knocked in um, by his uh, by his by his teammates. So try when you try to look at RBIs and it's like I said, my goal was to find something useful about RBIs and I did. What are RBIs good RBIs good for? Proper lineup configurations. If you're going to insist on using an RBI. And using that as some sort of tool, then what you should be able to do is look at it and say, there should be some expectations that this guy should be knocking in so many runs. He should be helping his teammates so much, especially if he's hitting third or fourth or fifth in the lineup. And your expectation is to that he should be getting a lot of RBIs. Well, you have to check and say, is he the right type of hitter? If you have a singles hitter, he might not be doing it. You need somebody that's going to hit doubles, have a low, have a high slugging percentage and a high on bit, you know, OPS. You're also going to want to make sure that the people that you're putting inside there in front of him are also getting on base, not getting in a good position on base and not getting themselves out a lot. So that's what I really think that you can do with uh, the RBI. You can use that as a tool to try to see if there's a way that you can tweak your lineup inside there. And I think teams that can maximize this, you might want to look um, at managers that are properly setting up their lineups. If you look at the 2001 um, Giants, I don't think Dusty Baker did the bet, made the best use of um, having Barry Bonds hit 73 home runs. And there may have been reasons why he decided to do that. I, I, I didn't research that too much. But if you look at Whitey Herzog, he got the best out of Tom Herr for, for one season by putting him in that proper position. And you wonder how the Padres would have done, who finished fourth in their division, despite Joe Carter coming up with all these times where he could have scored, knocked in more runs, and he didn't. So that's where I think the RBI is. That's where I think it's important. And that's sort of how I use the duality of um, stats to look at the data and get some context and infer some context from that and try to figure out a way to take, because you're not going to get rid of the RBI. But let's see a way we can either use it better in context or make a better version of it to try to get people to go. Um, then the next part I want to do is earned runs have always caused me to cringe. Not that people give it up, but because earned run, I think, is another case where we're giving credit that really isn't due. And I can understand back in the day when errors were more prevailing, prevailing in baseball that you didn't always want to stick the pitcher with credit for giving up a run. So, quote, unquote, the offense had to earn it. But if you go and look in the rule book, and I didn't put it in there, the determination between an error, what is an error, or what is an earned run and isn't, gets pretty confusing really quick. There's also the fact that an error is determined by a scorer. <clears throat> looking at what happened and say, 
yeah, yeah, it looks like you should have got that, or it looks like you fumbled it, um, or that was a bad play. Uh, many a no-hitters have been decided by whether somebody scores something in error or not. So I don't like that aspect of it. It's it's too subjective to now really be, while it's considered a data point, it was an error, it, it's not, it, it's, 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 I still think it's context instead of being an actual stat. And this wasn't, this isn't something new. I mean, back in the 1870s, uh, Henry Chadwick, who created a lot of the scoring systems and everything like that uh, for baseball, also when he would consider fielding percentage, he never included errors. Uh, and Al Wright also published one, I think this, I think it was in Sporting News, uh, which was putouts plus assists divided by games. That was fielding percentage. Uh, it didn't really go in there. People like to include their errors. And I think part of it was because if you don't include the errors, then you're just giving pitchers credits for runs. And ERA is going to go up. You know, your, your earned run average is going to go up because now it becomes a run average. And they did not want to. Pitchers were happy. You didn't want to make the pitchers unhappy because they were becoming very important to the game and very expensive. But I think if they would have put run average in there, you could have paid them less. But then 100 years later, <laughs> Bill James comes up and he creates range factor, which is very much like what was done a hundred years ago. So I, I like that because put outs and assists are data points. And then we can infer from that to go forward. But when you, and then when you look at fielding percentage, Ozzie Smith, who the, the eyes have it was probably one of the flashiest and best defenders shortstops out there. He got a lot of errors because he could get to more balls than other people. Um, if you record, if you take a look at the balls Ozzy Smith could get to um, versus what Derek Jeter could get to, uh, and even Omar Vizquel, who was a very talented and leads the uh, his career leader for shortstops in fielding percentage, they did not have the range and they didn't have the, a level of assists and putouts that Ozzy Smith did. But Ozzy Smith is lower on the fielding scale because – he occasionally would get to a ball and have a bad throw, which does not seem fair when you're recording errors. But if, when you're recording errors, but then of course that means you no longer have earned runs. And I think that's part of what the game needs. I think in terms of stats, you should focus more on runs because the actual runs scored, not earned runs because all of a sudden you're taking your data points and throwing some of them out because of some mythical context rule. So you, you're clearing off the bad points, which means you're going to make the, your, your um, context, you're going to make that a little bit different. So I think when you're measuring offensive runs, you should always use um, all the runs they give. And there's some other ways that you could also do this. It's, I don't think it's exactly fair if we come to, say, relievers, that a guy comes in with no runs, down by four, and the base is loaded, and he lets all of those batters um, score, then gets out without having any runs credited towards him. All of those go back to there. I think another thing we that may be good in moving forward is – giving the context of the pitcher that lets that score come in, just like the batter might get a credit for an RBI, the pitcher who allows that to come in should get that credit. I think that will take things a little bit better. It's going to look really odd for a while, um, but I, I, I think that's going to give her a better indication of how a pitcher is doing in high leverage and low leverage situations we don't have to give holes and saves. We can we can change the way that we think about how we score pitchers um, with related to runs, and I think we'll get a much better idea of who the better pitchers are 
especially when it comes to relievers. And also, I think there's some better tools than an earned run average or a run average. Things like FIP and XFIP and Sierra, all they use linear weights for the most part, but they all take in different aspects. And that is a way that you can look at pitchers giving up actual runs um, and what they're responsible for and separate it out. So I think we're starting to get those tools in there where looking at a run average might not be the best. An earned run average might not be the best way. We might want to go to a run average, which gives credit to when people actually screw up and make allow runs to get past home plate. Um, now there's, uh, I actually read a book, uh, a couple books by uh, Victor Wooten, who's my favorite, one of my favorite musicians. And I think part of the duality he caught, he catches really good. And I recommend he's given a couple TED talks. He's written two books, um, about music. And he says, and a lot of things that he tries to express is musicians are taught to make themselves better. You will teach somebody to play the bass better. Alex, or, um, you know, get a groove better, learn your music theory, do all this. One thing that very few people do is we'll teach a musician how to make other people better. And that is, I think, part of this duality in stats is when you go back, even on your fantasy, even on your, with your fantasy teams where runs and RBIs and strikeouts and things are very important, a lot of those stats come back and rely on who the teammates are or the people that you have. So another duality in baseball stats and fantasy stats in general is the, what may be good for your fantasy team may not exactly be good for your favorite team. They may, you may win the championship, but if they went by some of the ways that you did it, they may not perform very well. So you have that duality when you're creating stats of, is this something we'll make for a successful fantasy team versus is this something that would be successful for a baseball team? And you may come into a quandary of, I love this, but um, if my team ever did this, I'm going to go down in the front office and scream at them. So that's another thing we have to do because in fantasy sports, you still have to rely on people that might be on somebody else's roster to do well. For your team to do well. For example, if your fantasy league is using RBIs as a stat, you have to hope that the, and then of course you'll use runs. You have to hope that somebody else on your, somebody else, maybe in your league, their players that happen to be on your teams are very good at scoring runs being knocked in by your player. Um, so that's another part of the duality, and that's another way to do that. And I admit, I love watching you guys play fans. I don't play fantasy baseball because I have problems like this. I could not root for somebody else's team too well, um, even if it means my guy to do well. So I, I have almost an ethical dilemma with that. Um, oops. So how, how, then it comes down to how do we use this? Um, and I think the important part in here is taking a look – um, and really understanding the stats that we're doing and how we can improve and give meaning to them and trying to see if they're a data point stat or a contextual stat. For example, we can look at launch angle. But when we look at launch angle, well, what are the things that we're trying to do? We're trying to see where will the ball go? And what are the chances that it will be a hit? And then also, one of the things you can probably defer from launch angle is if that ball is going to go far enough, great. If it's if it's a home run, great. If it's not, what should be the expectation that the runner should get to? Because now we have data points where we can tell where the fielders are, how fast they run. That's a data point. We don't have to defer that that is calculated and you can find that information out relatively easy. So we should be able to start determining when balls land, say uh, at progressive field um, and bounce to the, and whether they bounce to the wall in general, 
when a ball is sort of like this, it should be a single or it should be a double. Then we can start looking and since we can figure that out, we can defer that information. Then maybe we use that to start seeing, well, okay, now this runner is getting to third base or getting to second base. These people are, these runners are going farther than the expectation to try to find a way that maybe we can start determining a lot better um, run stats or, or, you know, how people are on the baselines. And I know I am talking about things that have probably already been done, um, but I try to keep myself away from those so I wouldn't be saying, oh, so-and-so has this, so it's done. Um, I think it's good that people should go and question um, and look at things that are even already out there and let's see if we can falsify them. Let's see if we can improve on them. Um, let's really dig down into what they're showing. Like I said, use what data they're using, what, what their data they're deferring from and how they're going forward. And let's see how we can, we can improve those or take that and put that and give it a little bit more context. Because if you look at fan graphs, like I said, the Guardians had uh, Stephen Kwan, uh, our center fielder's name completely separated me, and Jose Ramirez, who were very good at the base paths, um, not just stealing bases, but also in getting a little bit further, going from first to second, make, turning a single into a double without generating as much, generating outs. Obviously, when somebody is running and trying to go and do th farther beyond their expectations, we know it's around 75%, 80% for uh, stolen base rate. Um, once you get below that, you start hurting the team. But now let's see what happens maybe. What's that percentage of people, people not named Albert Pujols, trying to get that extra base? That would be a nice contextual stat. And I think we could tie that back a little bit to launch angles and things like that. You probably can't use that as much as, uh, for fantasy, but I think that would be really, really interesting. And I think that would give a whole lot more context to the game. And then this comes over to my third, the third point I have here. If we start to understand this game better and maybe get these stats that are a little bit more conceptual, we can start looking back at the old observability scouting that used to happen where you know, they looked at things and said, well, we want to sacrifice bunt because if we get the guy from second to third, he's closer to home, therefore we go. We know that that is, that is not a very good plan because if there's a man on first and third and first, your run expectancy by looking, by deferring that from the data is better than ha with zero outs, let's say, than instead of having a man at third with one out. Because I, one of the things I think happened about in the night, I called 1996 the uh, when we went into the postmodern baseball, for, the, for, for lack of a better word. Because that's when the stats analysis, really, I think, really came in and the team's really seen the advantage of it. If we can sort of, I think what we did with a lot of that is we just told them, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. When I think they did they had some good concepts that needed some corrections, but all of a sudden they got, oh, after 50 years of doing thing one way, we just said, we're doing it in a new way, a new way. And that was very hard for people to say, well, I've done it for 50 years. I, I don't want to change your, you guys are morons. Look at you. You said that he's going to hit a home run and he's not going to hit a home run. I would have thrown this and done this different. I, I think if we bridge that gap a little bit more, I think we can tell better stories about baseball and we can then defer where we don't have those data points for the older games. If we get into those estimations, we can go look back and I think we can get a better idea of um, looking at some of those older stats. And I think we'll see that people like Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig were a lot more impressive than they already are. We'll find some new players that think we can come up with um, that maybe we should appreciate a little bit more, like Farius Finn, um, who's just a, a neat guy, and I, I just think we should know more about him because he's kind of cool. And 
And if we do that where we can do that with baseball, we can start looking at, say, like the Negro League stats or Korean League um, or, you know, the Japanese League and start looking for a little bit more context and a little bit more better stories um, and help understand those leagues a little bit so that we can have a much better, fuller story about baseball. And then the last thing is, I think by using this concept and using some of the ideas, we can make, we can eliminate some of the bad stats, we can improve them, and we can create these really great new, new apps. And as somebody that loves stories about baseball, part of that story of baseball is those stats that we get. Not straight data, but what we defer from them, what the context is. And it, it would be good to read some of these stories and look back at some of the history and be able to put a lot more context to some of those stories by having some of those stats. It, it, it's great that you know Joe Swowell pitched a no-hitter three starts after he got hit by lightning on the, in a game. It's great to know that. But if you take a look at Joe Swowell's history, he was an amazing pitcher and a humongous drunk. It would be fun to see if we can put a little bit more context as to maybe we could find out the times we won on vendors. Um, maybe we can find those out. It would be nice to be able to have a little bit more context, a little bit more in there so we can look back at baseball, predict the future a little bit, and maybe get to where we can make sure the right people get the MVP <laughs> um, and all of those things as we go forward. It's nice to have debates about them, but it'd be a little bit better to be a little bit sure that we're making sure we're giving the right people the right awards and the right praise um, as we go forward. And I think by looking at baseball, baseball stats in a slightly different way, in a slightly expanded way, I think we can help do that. And I just want to thank everybody. It's been great. Um, I, I always enjoy doing this. Um, I'm very supportive. Of, uh, you know, as somebody does baseball history, ALS is a great thing to support because I think uh, Lou Gehrig had the greatest offensive baseball season ever that last year that he played because he was playing it with the effects of ALS and still managed to be Lou Gehrig um, despite going through that terrible disease. So uh, thanks. Um, I've got my contact information there. When the baseball season starts, I will start my daily history lessons again. I just, in terms of researching them and getting them together, I didn't have enough time to do that over the, over the winter, except sporadically, but we will be back up and doing that. And then hopefully um, uh, you can follow me on there. I'm on Mastodon now and I'm on Twitter. And I hope to actually turn some of my history tweets into um, articles on a semi-weekly bit or a bi-weekly basis. So if you miss them, you can catch up with them. And um, I'm all good. Hey, Nick. Hey, Matt. That was so great. Um, I really want to give a plus one to the uh, the history tweets uh, that Matt puts out. I love them every single time. Um, and I want to give you a small gift. We have a couple minutes. And I want I wanted to do something special for you um as a, it, as a sign it? of my appreciation so <laughs> i i have something in the other screen here that i want to do really quickly yeah. this is... <laughs> you don't know this matt has been bothering me for about two years asking me to do a breakdown of jr richard um and this is the best i've got right now i mean this is a quick video this is him matched up against reggie jackson in the all-star game in 1980 um hopefully the video is all right I don't know what this is. I haven't actually looked at this. So you ready, Matt? I'm ready. All let's right, go. let's do it. Um, hopefully it's not too staggered for you guys. Um, my understanding is that he throws hard. Is that right? He throws hard. He throws a little wild. Um, well, that's got... not a strike. That's outside. <laughs> it's this is outside. Game. <laughs> all right, all right, fine. You know, you, you get you get that one, JR. It's how, how good of a framer Johnny Bench was. There it is. That's exactly it. <laughs> Um, is, they're gonna give them the breaking ball here. Oh, that's good. So that's actually a strike. <laughs> they didn't give him that one. All right, so it's a one-one count. I mean, I want to see the breaking ball. That's what I want to see. What do you got? If I remember correctly, you, you that looked like it almost a changeup. Okay. Wait, oh, this is, this is what I want to see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Games were a little bit different back then. Um, good, good, good graphics though. I mean. <laughs> Look, my understanding is that he overpowered guys, right, Matt? Yes, he, did. he he probably okay. threw harder than Nolan Ryan. Oh man. 
Oh yeah, you can see there how oh my gosh, how Reggie Jackson is just terrified at the plate here. I mean, without a doubt. So I think it's three one now. Ooh, okay. that, was, that was his breaking pitch there. Oh, that's like a cutter. Yeah. I mean, this is harder, right? This is a later break. I mean, I know we don't get much frames per second on these, but still. Oh, man. Look at look, one more time and see how much he curled up. Reggie Jackson, he is so dead. Oh, boy. Oh, this this is beautiful. No, All right, you throw it break. again. Throw it again or you throw a high heater here. I, I, I think he throws his curveball here. Right. Uh, sh no spoilers, Matt. I could Come be wrong. On. I watched this when I was 10. Oh, that looks like a splitter in the dirt. Did he have one of those? Was it a yeah, splitter? He did. Oh, yeah, that God. was a splitter. He, he All right. He now, here, I get here's it. a little context for this, though. Yeah. In about two weeks from this, um, mm -hmm. J.R. Richards would have a stroke and pass out before a game. No. Uh, what had oh happened is he had a blood clot in his shoulder, uh -huh. his throwing soldier, sh shoulder. Yeah. So he was there in the All-Star game making Reggie Jackson look ridiculous. Right. And he had been taking time off because he had a dead arm, and sometimes he couldn't feel his arm doing that. So he, oh, this was him pitching injured. Oh, my gosh. <clears throat> and unfortunately, he never came back from that stroke. Oh. He came back physically, but his he was, he was never the same. So this was like his last hurrah after spending like six years really becoming that pitcher. Yeah. And when he oh, pitched, man. he was with Nolan Ryan – uh, at the time, he was, Nolan Ryan was on the staff, mm -hmm. and Dusty Baker said that people would get the JR flu. So they would get sick and not face JR Richards. Oh. <laughs> so they could face <laughs> Nolan Ryan. Oh, that's hilarious. Uh, I mean, this is another one I saw. This was the one that I'll actually probably do a breakdown in full for you for. Right. Um, in 1979, this is what I found. I know you found me a larger video, I think. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll, I'll check. But uh, I was just trying to find it really quickly for you here. Uh, and, uh, I mean, this is a full game, um, from June, I'm yep. sorry, July of 1979. So and I will make that, I will make that. You got, you got to let me know when the special date is to put it out either something in your life that is like a important date. So I'll do it as a gift to you then, or if something, of course, with J.R. Richard, that would be a good day to do it. So yeah, let me, let, let me take a look. I'll, I'll get back in. All right. That sounds good. Yeah. But Matt, we can't think enough that I think that's a really fun discussion about just the, the, philosophy of baseball stats really and how we utilize them can't think i can't agree more but just about the double counting of rbi um and really just ops is all that matters guys that's <laughs> it it's just ops um really matt thank you so much feels like one be just like i mentioned with alex chamberlain feels like it wouldn't be pitch con without you being a part of it so really thank you so much for being a part of it glad to be here looking forward to the other talks oh man we've got some great ones too yes, so we do. Uh, yes we do all right take care matt thank you